Thanks for staying, everybody. Uh, uh, <clears throat> this is the title of the paper. I kind of made it a deliberately boring title because I think it's actually really badass work. <laughs> I didn't want to have to gild the lily, uh, uh, but I'm not going to really talk about it. I'm going to spend the time uh, giving the context behind the work, and, and then hopefully you'll be propelled to want to read about it when we get to it. So I've been working on this area for, for quite a number of years, and it's because I have this belief that computation, the manufactured computers, the way that we do it today is deeply broken. And it's broken in the following sense. The whole idea of hardware determinism, that a computer guarantees, a hardware guarantees, same program, same input, you're gonna get the same output. If you do it again, you get the same output. That idea is training wheels for computation. And we've been keeping the training wheels on our computer architectures for 70 years. As Inman was saying, real living systems, they don't do that. Living systems expect to deal with errors and uncertainties all the way up the computational stack. We don't. We think hardware is going to take care of it. And therefore, software acts like this incredible prima donna where everything has to be perfect. Wait, wait, wait. Six. You're welcome. This is software. And if anything goes wrong, software throws a tantrum and says, I'm in my trailer. We have to get beyond that. The, the flip side of it is, is that doing it the way we do it, we focus on efficiency. All we care about is correctness and efficiency only. CEO. Correctness and efficiency only. That's considered all you need for software. But in fact, what you need is robustness and working pretty well. We can have that, but we will not have that because we're stuck in the correct and efficient only attractor. So I suggest the future of computation is this idea of indefinite scalability. We won't have a CPU, we won't have a central processor. We will have oceans of little teeny processors that are interacting, they're failing, we're adding more to the thing, we're building the machine while it's running. And software, the entire computational process, will not guarantee you get the right answer. That was a crap guarantee anyway, as Inman also pointed out. Instead, we will have best effort. I will do my damnedest to get you an answer that's pretty good. And that's all you could ever really guarantee anyway. So, this is my mission. Fix computing. Make the world a better place. We have these, you know, a hundred million a bank account, uh, you know, credit card accounts get lost, 350 million uh, information gets leaked. We think that's normal. It's crazy. We are living in crazy land. So, I want to tell you what I've been doing for the last decade. I started in this thing with hardware. <clears throat> These are little computer tiles that were marketed briefly under the name Illuminato Ex Machina. And you get the idea. I did not pick the name, that was a marketing name. Uh, um, <clears throat> These individual little tiles that plug together, they share power, they share communications, you update the software in one of them and it goes hop to hop to hop to hop until the whole thing is updated. I wrote this, the operating system for this, that was great fun. They had their limitations, they were sort of a 2000 era uh, cell phone CPU panel. I went and looked to the software side of things. What are we going to put inside these little tiles? And the answer was going to be something like a cellular automata, but not the traditional one. Number one, it cannot be synchronous, because we're adding new tiles all the time. They run different speeds. We cannot wait for the last tile in Pluto to finish the tick before we go on to the next one. We cannot assume determinism. So the game of life is plain gone. We have to figure out how to compute without that. So these are the things, <clears throat> these are examples of a little sort of, these atoms would connect up and make little chains, and there was a copier so you could actually reproduce the chains. And it was very organic in the sense that it didn't even wait for one copy to be complete before it would start copying the copy that's copying in progress. Why? Because there was room, there was space, you could get another guy in there, which just happened. At the same time, so that was hardware, that was software, and then there was advocacy, because I realized that this correctness and efficiency only idea 
is so deep in our brains, especially in computer science, that we don't even realize it's determining this. I can't take time on this, but this is a sorting error. Imagine sorting where the comparisons might be wrong. Just too bad. Now our beautiful quick sort, merge sort, the pinnacle of computer science sorting theory, they do terrible. Why? Because they're designed to exploit the hardware determinism. Whereas bubble sort, pitiful, horrible, black sheep, everybody hates it, bubble sort is great. Why? Because it doesn't up the leverage. It compares things redundantly, it only moves them little bits, so if it gets it wrong, it doesn't move them very far. The bottom line here is that efficiency and robustness are at odds over redundancy. Robustness requires redundancy. Efficiency eliminates redundancy. So you've got to be careful when you motivate your work, especially if you're in A-life, on the grounds of efficiency. That's a red flag. We all do it. But realize you're vulnerable because you just said, I just made my system fragile right there wherever it was that you're claiming efficiency is the result. So we went on, we invented programming languages to help us express transitions in this asynchronous, not deterministic, cellular automaton language. Uh, here's an example, a fork bomb, you put one in the middle, you let it run, it grows, it goes crazy. Okay, well, big deal. Once you start having a little more complex transition functions, the code isn't quite as simple. We so the work that's actually new, the work that you can read in the paper this time, is a language called SPLAT, which stands for spatially, Spatial Programming Language ASCII Text. And the idea is you write little patterns with characters, Emacs picture mode, saying, that hat sign is me, the dot is anything. If you match that pattern, you can replace it with a me and another copy of me. There is a fork bomb element. And you can very quickly get to more complex ones. <coughs> These are rules that allow us to make a pairwise, a two-layer thick line grow in and out on the basis of the density that's inside. And we use it for making a simple cell membrane and it looks something like this. A seed, it sprouts, the two shades of blue are the inner membrane, the outer membrane, and it just goes like this. And the idea is the membrane has no state, it just says go away from high density, go toward low density. And as a result, when the insides move, the membrane moves with it. So, is this real? Is this a simulation? We're now taking the simulator, putting it into physical hardware tiles, and letting them talk to each other. Is it real? Is it a simulation? Of course, it's both, depending on how you look at it. I've used up more of my time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I thought that was a really fantastic talk. How are you going to convince people that deterministic hardware and software can be, if you want, improved with this new approach? I mean, people like to blame things. They like to blame other people. They like to take sure. yeah, something and just make it responsible for mistakes, for errors, for... It's been great for the software. Anything that goes wrong is if it's a hardware problem. My hands are clean. And we have to renegotiate that boundary. And that's what best effort is all about. Hardware promises its best effort, but it reserves the right to fail and fail arbitrarily. So software has to carry some of the load. Are there people going to like that? No. Tough. So exactly how we get to it, I don't know. My goal is to get as many people as I can, as excited as I can, about wanting to work on this, about thinking that there's an alternative to what we're doing now, and see if we can't get to it to the Next question is for Robin. Uh, Brilliant, as always. Um, 
I, I think maybe my question is going to be reminiscent of questions I've asked you before uh, at talks that you give that are similar to this one. They're all the same. But, but um, uh, going back to um, uh, Inman's point, one of Inman's points, uh, I think, is that even though software um, appears to be uh, to adhere to the CEO paradigm. Yeah. In point of fact, it doesn't. It depends on the software. Because it's failing all the time, and we're living with software failures all the time, mm -hmm. and, and we do get on the plane anyway. And, um, uh, and there's various versions of, of uh, software failing uh, and dealing with failures uh, that are out there in the world right now yeah. that aren't a result of engineering, um, uh, of engineering a new software the right way, the way you're doing it, but rather, you know, we have uh, internet protocols that are waiting yes. around for, for packets right. to come, and, yeah. and, and so I'm wondering if there's um, uh, an ongoing uh, software engineering evolution there is. that's kind of creating a path towards what you're talking about yeah. Without yeah, yeah, yeah. doing things yeah. right away from the ground up. Norm, norm, that's great, yeah. Uh, there, there is, it, the, and someone was talking about it in the Signal GP talk the other day, the whole idea of going to event driven. It, if you make the chain between input and output be as short as you possibly can, and then lean back on the state of the environment, then you have less at risk. You can still, obviously, you can use. Uh, Event driven is enough to do towers. I know I am making incredibly hard relevant systems, but by and large, you get less dependencies with shorter program chains. So that's an example of how it's happening anyway. My concern is, is that it's happening so slowly, and the, the urge to domination, the urge to compute as a dictator with top down, must go like this, must go like this, is hard to resist unless we understand the costs. So I'm trying to plan a flight all the way at the other end and say, look, it could be this. We could actually compute this way. It's not too advanced, but it's unbelievably tough. Uh, I think we're going to take one of those two questions from Dr. Rose. I think your proposal is actually quantum computing, right? I mean, it's quantum? Quantum computing. I mean, we, I obviously came to a university, and they were all about, oh, we need to bring down the error rates, and stuff yeah. like that. Maybe the proposal is to say, you don't need to do that. Actually, you just you know, take advantage of it, and uh, just implement what you differently. I mean, the aim that could actually make a big contribution to developing the architectures of the quantum computing. Yeah, that could be. I, at this point, I have to confess that I'm a quantum curmudgeon. And I actually believe that once uh, error containment and decoherence are properly accounted for, what we're going to get out of quantum is huge constant factor. Uh, we're going to use it because huge constant factors are nice, but it's actually not going to be measurable. And so it's orthogonal to this issue that it would be nice if instead of using our quantum computers to do a NAND gate or play tic tac toe, we thought about doing something more like this, but it's a separate issue. So there are plenty of other questions. Unfortunately, we have to uh, um, end it here. There's going to be uh, an announcement. If, if, uh, if, if those who want to ask questions are around in the very, very last session of the day, uh, there's, there's a workshop and they will going to be there too. So in fact, there will be one place where there's discussion will be picked up. Uh, I'll in the coffee. Uh,